So we're on to class seven, where last class we were in the middle of talking about non-US stocks. So what we'll do this class is like we've done before, and I hope, I hope you're doing this as well, is review what we've done so far in your own words. That's really important for the first exam that you can do this in your own words. What I talk about often with my students is conversational intelligence, which is you can sit down and off the top of your head explain to someone exactly what we've covered in this class without looking at notes, without having needing help uh, copying and pasting, but entirely off top of your head. So we'll, we'll do that real quickly today to review where we've been. Then we'll finish up the stock subcategories, the U of Bucks, B-U-C-S, so the U.S. versus non-U.S., and then get a little bit into alternatives. So quick review. So we define what an investment portfolio is. It's a collection of assets <clears throat> that are being held for some future purpose, some future liability, um, some future cash outflow like retirement. To help someone set up an investment portfolio, you need to ask three questions. First, why is this person investing? And the key there is the horizon. Do they need the money next week or in 50 years when they retire? Second question is what asset classes do they consider to be separate asset classes? That's what we're studying right now, going through the major asset classes and then the, the sub-asset classes of the major asset classes. Um, so we talked about parsimony. Parsimony means you want enough asset classes to be able to explain risk, which means you have to get a good high R squared. How much of the risk can you explain using those asset classes? but you don't want any more than that. You want to be parsimonious. The third question is how will you execute this? Will you do it yourself? Will you hire a manager? Will you be passive? Will you be active? Then we talked about the major asset classes, cash, bonds, um, our fixed income, stocks, our equities, and alternatives. On each one of these, we're going to go to the subcategories that you want to be able to define list the subcategories and talk about the strategy under each one. So there's subcategories and there's subcategories of the subcategories. The first major asset class was cash and we had to distinguish between cash and bonds. Remember, ca remember cash has high reinvestment risk because it's very sensitive to current interest rates but has very low price risk. Its price just does not move around very much at all. Whereas bonds have varying degrees of reinvestment risk and varying degrees of uh, price risk. And then we got in, in the cash, there was no subcategories in cash, but you can talk about it being a low risk asset, at least from a price risk standpoint, low expected returns, but also some good correlation to other assets because cash tends to do well in a crisis. Then we got the bonds, and that's where we did DC cuts I, so go back and review DC cuts I for each one of them, like the first Letter, the D, duration, you define it. Duration is the weighted average time to maturity using the discounted cash flow as weights. It's a measure of price risk using the, the, the formula minus duration times unchanging yield to get how much you think the bond will move in price. The subcategories are short term, inter intermediate term, and long term, and the strategy if you expect interest rates to fall, you want the lengthened duration. If you expect interest rates to rise, you want a shortened duration. So you need to do that with each one of the DC cuts I, duration, convexity, credit, US versus non-US. This is related to stock, the bonds. We'll get into U on their stocks, where the U there is very highly related to the core currency exposure. Tax, the T for tax. Some bonds are taxable, some are tax exempt. Structured, there are some highly structured bonds and then I, inflation. Then we got into stocks. We had an introductory to stocks. The expected return on stocks, remember, is the dividend yield plus expected growth. Expected growth um, for stock earnings. Uh, so, you know, your dividend yield plus expected earnings growth. The expected earnings growth on stocks should be highly correlated to the expected growth in our economy. The expected growth in our economy will be tied to expected productivity growth expected labor labor growth, and expected inflation. Then we get into the subcategories, B, U, C, S. B is for beta. We define beta, which is how sensitive a stock is to the overall economy. We define the subcategories. Again, you define and you have the subcategories. 
where you have high beta stocks like cyclicals, um, like consumer discretionary, and low beta stocks, defensive stocks like cons consumer staples and healthcare. And then the strategy is you want to avoid stocks and reduce the beta of your portfolio if you expect a recession, re recession and you want to increase your stock allocation and get into higher beta stocks if you expect a recovery. The C was for capitalization. We had large cap stocks, medium cap stocks, small cap stocks. So large, so capitalization has to do with how large is the company on a market value basis. And during a recession, before you move into a recession, if you're expecting a recession, move higher in the capitalization, move the higher quality stocks. S for, for style, we talked about growth and value stocks, growth stocks being expensive but have really good fundamentals. They're growing fast, strong companies. Value stocks looking like cheap stocks, but generally have some serious problem going on. Recently, they've done really badly. Because of that, growth stocks do better in a recession than value stocks because growth stocks are actually high quality, good fundamental companies, whereas value stocks tend to be low quality, struggling companies. And then we got to the U. On the U, we defined it, U.S. So there's global, which is both U.S. and international. And under global, with you have U.S. So we've already talked about U.S. when we talked about beta, capitalization, and style. So now we'll talk about non-U.S. Non-U.S. is also known as international. International stocks can be broken up into developed market stocks and emerging market stocks. So that's where we got last time. What I want to show you is how Standard and Poor's um, and their methodology, I, I give you that as a link in our in Blackboard. It's a really short document. So there's two documents I gave you. One is from S&P and the other one is, is from MSCI. MSCI used to be Morgan Stanley Capital Indices, but now it's all by itself. It was spun off from Morgan Stanley, so it's just MSCI. So S&P is uh, their methodology, how they define whether a market is emerging or developed or frontier. It's shown on this chart. It's real simple. If you look at the MSCI document, it's much longer, much more detailed. So I like the S&P document because it's nice and short, gets right to the point, and gives you a quick education. If you really want to understand this in a better way, you can read through that document. But what Standard & Poor's says is developed market. So U.S. is a developed market, but um, other developed markets, they have a large, at least a decent size um, Stock market, this is two and a half billion. Obviously, we have stocks in the United States that are a trillion dollars. So two and a half billion is not all that large. Their turnover is a billion. We turn over a billion probably in a few minutes in the US. I've done billion dollar trades myself personally where I picked up the phone and moved a billion dollars. So that's not all that impressive. They, they, they developed exchange that ratio over 5%. My understanding of that is the stock market represents at least 5% of the overall economy. You can look at the U.S. Our stock market is a large percentage of our economy. Um, so we meet that definition. Those are fairly weak definitions, but it's the same requirement for emerging. So frontier markets are the ones that struggle here. So this is not all that impressive. When you get to separating developed and emerging, developed must meet all of these criteria. So two and a half billion is not large enough. It needs to be 15 billion. Settlement T plus three. I've done some settlement trades that were T plus zero. What that means is, uh, if you do the trade, when do you do you have to move the money? So T plus three means you do the trade today and you have to send the money by wire within three days. But yeah, I've done I've done T plus zero trades where we actually move the money the same day as the trade. The sovereign debt must be double B plus or higher. That's not all that great of a rating, but at least double B plus. Can't have hyperinflation, so countries like um, uh, Venezuela or Argentina or uh, there's a couple of Afri Af countries in Africa that are struggling with hyperinflation right now. Uh, that would kick them out. No foreign ownership restrictions. I think China has some problems there where they really restrict who can invest in their stock market. Uh, freely traded foreign currency, and again, China might have a little issue there. Obviously, the U.S. and Europe. Uh, with the euro and the UK with uh, the pound, those are all floating currencies. So developed markets meet all of those criteria. And then your per capita, how much your economy when it's spread to, to each individual, 
needs to be 15,000 or higher. That's a pretty high restriction for developed countries. The last time I saw China, I thought their per cap was about 7,000. So let me um, let me just see real quickly if I can pull that up. So here's a chart. I don't know the, how good this this source is, but it shows you GDP per capita back to 2017. So that's a pretty pretty good number. Um, and then they compare it to the overall world. So you see the world's per capita is 17,000. It's possible um, S&P might be increasing number here. I don't know how, how old that document is. I should look it up and see if they change some of their numbers. But the world is 17,000. Uh, is how much an economy is worth per person. That, you know, that could be skewed. The median might be much lower than that because they may have some really, really wealthy people. I think Qatar might be in Luxembourg, maybe those kind of countries. But here you see the per capita, boy, it's really, really high in some of these countries. United States, we're right at $60,000. So if you come down, Japan, see how much they've they've dropped. Uh, South Korea, uh, Russia, man, these are higher numbers than I would have expected some of these countries. Iraq is actually looking pretty good, probably because of their oil. So you keep coming down. Egypt, 11000 I don't know how much they've fallen off here recently. So you can just go in and, and just see. Um, so my understanding was China was in the about the seven thousand dollar range, but I don't see China in here. There it is, China. Wow, sixteen. So China actually, according to this number, looks pretty good. Um, now this is a purchasing power parity approach. GDP nominal is the actual reported number. So you can see if, if their currency is valued very differently than dollars, see how much difference that can make. Here they're doing the PPP. So when you look at China in that standpoint, uh, that's probably what the S&P is going on. It's much smaller just because their currency is probably well undervalued versus the U.S. Um, now this is 2017 as well. So you can ch see China is... Um, $8,000, so they're above the seven, so they've actually done fairly well. And you can see how these two lists are really quite quite radically different. Um, so Luxembourg is by the highest when you use nominal numbers. The United States obviously is 59,000 in both because they're doing it against the dollar on a purchase power parity basis. Um, so the poorest country that's on this list, it's hard to believe people can survive. 293, 357, that's that's a dollar a day. And that's the definition of poverty in the world is I think has been two dollars a day. So countries that don't make at least two dollars a day are an extreme poverty. And you can definitely see there's some countries. I mean, how do you possibly live off $293 a year? Um, the country I do a lot of work in, Costa Rica, um, not not doing out great, eleven thousand five hundred. So um, so not very strong. If you look at uh, Mexico, Mexico not doing as well as Costa Rica, but nine thousand. But you can see on a purchasing power basis, it makes a big difference. Which means, yeah, their people make much less money when you convert it back to U.S. dollars. But in Mexico, uh, given where the peso is, they can they can actually buy more stuff. And given the prices of things, they can actually buy more stuff with the 9,000 they have. They can buy twice as much stuff in Mexico with the income they have. So, you know, versus power to parity is actually quite important. But anyway, that gives you some sense of what S&P is looking at. Uh, and if their standard is 15,000 and they're probably doing it on a nominal basis, that gets you down to Chile and you get a break between Chile and Argentina. So, yeah, it does leave out some fairly well known countries. So there's the S&P's requirements. You can see Frontier are really struggling countries. There's no requirements at all down here. No requirements on, on GDP. Oh, I'm sorry. There it says it right there is that GDP is on a PPP basis. So that includes a lot more countries just because the dollar, what the dollar has been doing uh, lately. So Interesting stuff. I encourage you, especially if you're interviewing with a firm that does international stocks, I would read this entire S&P methodology. It's not very long. Uh, go to standardandpoors.com 
and see if there's an updated version. I, I, I can't remember the last time I updated this. I'll have to look and see if I find an updated version, I'll put it out there on, on Blackboard. But um, it it's interesting stuff and it's simple. If you really want to get into it, then load up the MSCI version um, and get even more detail. What the MSCI does is they go beyond just frontier emerging and develop. They also talk about growth and value and capitalization. Uh, so they go into other criteria. <laughs> now, international stocks have not been the place to be. The U.S. stock market has materially outperformed other markets. You can see everything sold off because of COVID-19, including uh, em emerging and developed markets. So this top line is the U.S. Over the last couple years, it's up about 34%. You can see developed and emerging are both flat to slightly down. Uh, emerging or right at zero developed markets mainly because Europe's been really struggling is down about three four point seven percent so yeah it has not been a place to be um, and this has been a big debate I, I mentioned Jack Bogle who was the founder of Vanguard he did not believe believe in international stocks he was somewhat of an outlier Vanguard definitely believes in international stocks and they have a lot of allocation but Jack Bogle would look at these long term. If you look really, really long term, the U.S. Have, has really been dominating world markets. Um, and his argument was just buy the U.S. In the U.S., you'll get some, you'll get some global companies like Coca-Cola and Exxon. So you'll get, you'll get some international exposure, but you're better off just buying the U.S. He's very much in a minority on that. And if you went to Vanguard today, they would strongly disagree with him. And he knew that he was in a minority. You can go out and find YouTube's find YouTubes where he talks about this issue where he just does not like non-US stocks but um, yeah it just has not done well. Now you can see uh, they started off all together and then the US kept doing well and then we had that one big blow up at the end of 2019 didn't last very long uh, the stock market shot back up right away then I had another huge shoot up um, going into uh, 2020 really incredible and then COVID-19 causing incredible sell-off but we're almost back to where we were I did these um, maybe by the time you watch this in a class the US will already be ahead of its previous high this was its all-time high here and it sold off and so we're getting close that's a really incredible recovery so um, <clears throat> So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, international, but there is a glowing, growing trend to not separating it between U.S. and non-U.S. and instead looking at things on a more global basis. So some people instead of say, give me some U.S. stocks, give me some U.S. non-U.S. stocks, they just say, give me some global stocks, some global large cap, global mid cap, global small cap. Forget where they're located, just focus on the size of the company. And there's, there's most people do believe you do need to break up stocks in these at least these three categories. There is some debate about value versus growth, whether that really means anything anymore, but there's still a strong consensus that companies by capitalization is an important break, but you could do it at a global basis. Other people say, well, that's fine, except for it depends on the sector. So there are some sectors that are truly global, like energy, so for global sectors, look for your stocks on a global basis. So if you're looking at Exxon versus British Petroleum, yeah, it doesn't really matter what they're located. They're competing against each other. Doesn't really make sense to, you know, Exxon's going to do well when oil prices are high. British Petroleum will do well when, when oil prices are high. It really doesn't matter what the U.S. economy is doing or what the U.K. economy is doing relative to each other. It's the global market. But then other sectors are much more local. So consumer services, or rest, like restaurants, or healthcare, those tend to be much more local. So, so you try to find some way to combine country and sector in some efficient, parsimonious way. So maybe you have four sectors that are global, and you have seven sectors that are local. On the four that are global, you buy those stocks on a global basis for the seven that are local. Um, you buy those sectors in the U.S. and then you buy them in non-U.S. and you separate those out. So there, there's different ways to do it. I just want to let you know the way I showed you uh, with the BUCS is the more traditional way, and that's that's still probably the most standard way. That's probably still 80% of the way the world, and probably 95% of the way the world breaks it up. But there is 
somewhat of a trend to get a little bit more uh, precise, really looking at the parsimonious and see if you can explain risk in a much more healthy, logical way. Now, this is an area where you can do a lot of extra research. <clears throat> um, so I'll walk through a few of these. Um, there are countries um, that are doing better than others, uh, countries that are growing faster, countries that have better regulatory regimes, better cultures, better infrastructure, better institutions. Um, but that's not what, really what we're looking for because the best countries, the countries that are run the best, have the best governments, the best business environments, um, they've always been good and that's already priced into their market. So really what you're looking for are what are, those, what are those countries that have done horribly in the past but are showing great improvement. And I cannot think of countries right now. Now, I, I love The Economist and every year The Economist has their country of the year. Uh, I forget who they chose this last time, but um, a lot of times the country they pick is not necessarily the countries that's doing great, but it's the country that is turned around the most. Went from a really bad situation, might, maybe they had an oligarchy, I mean they had a, a, a tyrant running the country and they switched to, um, to democracy, had their first elections, uh, maybe they freed up their economy some, we're seeing that in, in some European countries are trying to free up the labor laws and make it easier to do business. So you're really looking at what are those countries that are improving the best. So let's look. I love this um, this ease of doing business index. So let's switch over to that. And this is from the World Bank. They have rankings. There's a lot more stuff here. This is another place where you can really do a lot of extra research. They even have a button called research, which would bring up a lot of articles and other links that would really be, be quite interesting, I think. If you're trying to find a topic to um, to write about, and there's one particular company you're really interested in, and if any of you are international studies students, this would be a really great website to go to. Um, but let's look at this ranking. To me, it's very, very interesting, not just how countries rank, but also what are they ranking on. And you can see the criteria. Here's the overall rank. New Zealand is number one. I've always wanted to go to New Zealand. Singapore is number two. I've always wanted to go to Singapore. Hong Kong, those are the three countries, well, even Denmark. These are the four countries I've most wanted to visit. I'm a cyclist, and I love to go cycle there. Um, they're all countries where you can get around pretty well with English, I believe. So uh, since I don't have language skills, it would be nice to go somewhere. And I have some students, former students in Hong Kong, who said they would walk me around if I ever visited there. might be a tough time to go right now, but... Um, United States is ranked sixth, and then you see where they come after that. Um, you see a lot of European countries, a few Asian countries. Taiwan uh, ranks pretty high. Um, then you start getting into a little bit smaller countries, but Japan, Spain, China. I, I don't know what the, that, that button means, so you'd have to click on that. All the way down to the countries that are really, really, really struggling. In the middle of the pack, El Salvador, Nepal, the Philippines. Um, at the very, very end, Somalia, Eritrea, Venezuela. Obviously, Venezuela probably has moved down the list quite dramatically. Um, South Sudan. Uh, my sister-in-law goes to Sudan to do medical work. She's a doctor. And, yeah, it's real scary when she goes. I, I really worry a lot about her because there's a lot of bombing going on. Uh, Haiti's had some issues recently and also being exacerbated by um, hurricanes. So you see all the way through through or countries, you'd ex you expect countries to be ranked where they are. There's no surprises there. The next thing that's interesting in here is not just who's doing best, but who's doing best in which category. Um, so how easy is it to start a business? You can see in the U.S. it's gotten really difficult. That's why I recommended watching some of the Institute of Justice videos. Regulation in the U.S. has become less and less about protecting the consumer, protecting us from um, you know, bad doctors or tainted food. It's become more about regulation in order to protect incumbents, those who already have power, who are already in business. And a lot of reg regulation is to keep 
keep those businesses from having to face competition. So that's why the U.S., I, I, I think the U.S. really needs a lot of work here. I wish we'd have some politicians coming in to say we really need to change this. Um, there's a lot of examples of that. Construction permits, the U.S. Works, ranks a little bit better there. There are some countries... Um, See if I can get these alphabetical. There's some countries, a good example is India. I don't know if you follow India. Um, doing business in India is extremely difficult. I'm surprised they do well in construction permits, but they do, they look like they're doing better there. But an extremely difficult country to do, do business in. I do a lot of work in Costa Rica. Let's see how they rank. I know how they really rank. But starting business 144, that is absolutely true. Uh, we started a restaurant in Costa Rica, and oh my word, the amount of regulation and red tape you have to go through to start a restaurant is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, just opening a bank account, I don't know if that's one of their, one of their categories, doesn't look like it, but that getting credit might be part of that. Um, they actually rank well on, fit, on credit, getting credit. I'm surprised about that because it's so difficult to do banking in Costa Rica. Resolving insolvencies. So let's go back and look at India there. That has been an issue in India. Let's see if they've gotten better there. They rank 52nd, so it looks like they're kind of in the middle of the pack. But there are some countries that do not have bankruptcy laws. So it's very difficult to go bank. In the U.S., you go bankrupt. Let's see how the U.S. ranks there. U.S. to go bankrupt, we have laws that help you walk through the bankruptcy. Yeah, we rank number two there, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, enforcing contracts. Um, who ranks Who ranks last there? Well, countries, some of these countries I'm not even familiar with. Myanmar, Angola. Who ranks best on enforcing contracts? Singapore, Korean. Uh, you can see the U.S. is not even in there. you got to go down quite a ways to find the U.S., so. 1739 on trading across borders, paying taxes, uh, protecting minority in investors, uh, getting credit, U.S. ranks very high there, registering property. In my property and casualty class, we talk about title insurance, which is insurance in case you buy property that doesn't belong to the person who sold it to you. But there are some countries who have figured that out and done it in a way that you really don't need title insurance. And because of that, you know, those countries should have a huge advantage when it comes to registering property, proving that you own something. Getting electricity, I don't know why the U.S. ranks so low there. Um, dealing with construction all the way through. So it's interesting stuff, and then you have this additional um, research that you can look at. Uh, you can look within regions. You can look at... Um, by income categories, who are the best high-income countries? It's probably the same list as we saw before. Who are the best low-income uh, low countries? So R Rwanda. Now, that's an amazing story. It's just truly amazing uh, how well that country has come back after that uh, horrible genocide they faced several years ago. It's just, there's some amazing stories here, and that's, that's somewhat what you're looking for, those firms that used to be ranked really low but are moving up in the pack. Um, and well, you can see, you know, Rwanda is now the highest ranked low income country uh, in the world. That's an amazing story, um, which means there's you know, investment opportunity is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the quality of life of the individuals in this country. But investment opportunities are also there. I don't know what investment alter um, Opportunities there might be in Rwanda, but it looks like an interesting country to have been looking at the last few years. But anyway, interesting stuff. I really encourage you to go out and read this stuff. Bring it into your other classes. Bring it up in interviews so that you have uh, some knowledge that goes beyond just the textbook. And I'm still, I'm still worried, wondering what these yellow dots mean. Subnational. So that means they've got other countries within the country, so um, not exactly sure what all that means. But anyway, interesting stuff. I encourage you to do more research. There's a lot more research you can do here. There's some books I recommend. One is by Jim Rogers, and he's probably, um, he, he's written many articles. You might even do a YouTube on his name. He tends to be a little bit 
he, he promotes and markets certain firms, so you might be getting some of his marketing stuff. But if you find Jim Rogers in a good YouTube interview or in a podcast, I like him because he's he's this older rich guy, and because he's rich and because he's you know he's already finished his career, everything's set for him. Boy, he speaks his mind, and he he says some really really interesting things. Um, so so street smarts, Jim Rogers. The next one is Why Nations Fail. It's a book by these two gentlemen. This is what it looks like. It's a very long book, but oh, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it's all the research that's on why are some countries doing well and some countries doing poorly. Why was Argentina one of the richest nations in the world in 1900, and now it's struggling, can't get its feet on the ground, just can't get any stability, doesn't matter. You know, they've been turning their government over uh, here quite frequently the last few years. They just cannot seem to get, get it going again. Uh, and this book talks about that. And it's a long book, not because the theory is that difficult. The theory itself is covered in the first chapter very quickly. What they do the rest of the book is they prove that the theory is true by going through many, many examples, not just in the last 50 or 100 years, but even going much, much, much further back in time. So that's, that's an excellent, excellent book. <clears throat> I'd recommend it maybe over the winter break or during summer. Um, you know, read 20 pages a day and you'll get through it pretty quickly. The next one is a course. It's one of the great courses. Um, I use Audible and Audible just had a sale where you could get two of the great courses for a cost of one credit. Um, so the great courses, they're really good college classes. They're actually taught by the professor. Uh, I think the downside of the great courses is I think they're overpriced. I think they're too expensive. You might even... <laughs> You know, I just thought of this now. You might find a great courses class that you really like and look for that professor on YouTube and you might find, because of COVID-19, you might find their entire class for free on YouTube. But um, So that's, it's not really a book. It's it's a college course that you can take and you can buy the course uh, from, from um, Audible or you can actually buy from Amazon. So... There's two versions. There's an audible only version, and then they also had the video where you can see the slides from the class. One thing I'll tell you about this versus why nations fail. What a student of mine sent me a link to the Foundations of Economic Prosperity, recommending that I get this course. And as he described it, I thought, "Wow, it sounds just like why nations fail." And sure enough, why nations fail was a big part of their research that they brought into this class. So this class is actually a faster read than the book itself. I forget the timing, like 12 hours versus 18 hours or something. So if you could do one or either of these, you would be getting very, very similar stuff. <laughs> so that's excellent to read. And then uh, this last thing I recommend, and there's a far more than this. These are just some that, that, I, that I really like. Uh, this guy, Sarma, he's from Morgan Stanley. He does their international investing. He does some podcasts. He also has a book out that I read that I thought was very good. So, um, so Rusir Sharma, he has his four Ds. He talked about it, this on, if you, Barry Ritholtz has a podcast that I highly recommend. Um, it's called Masters in Business. Uh, there's a few others if you get my reading list that I have on Blackboard. It gives you a few other podcasts that I highly recommend. There's so many now. Um, you just... You know, you could probably put uh, Rusir Sharma in on YouTube and find, find him presenting at a conference. But he talks about the four Ds, and the four Ds are depopulation. So he's saying the world now is actually shrinking. Japan may not exist in 100 years. They're shrinking so fast. They're, gonna, they're going to drop in half by 2050, as some estimates. Um, even countries we think about as fast growing are really not growing that fast. Usually what happens... We talked about GDP per person, per cap. Usually when GDP per cap gets above ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, uh, birth rates drop dramatically. Wealthier nations tend to have much lower birth rates. Um, and so we'll probably see as the world, world gets wealthier, probably birth rates will continue to decline. I know everybody talks about there's too many people in the world, but actually the world population is probably very close to peaking. Um, there's a video I want to show you. 
It's Hans Rosling, Global Population Growth, Box by Box. Now, this is an old video, so you might look and see if he's updated it. But he talks about world, uh, global, global population growth. He does it in a very visual way, so you really can understand why he believes world population will peak at about 10 billion people and then steady and maybe even decline after that. You can see if he's updated it and gotten anything newer. It's a TED Talk. It's an older TED Talk. Uh, back from 2010, so it's already a decade old. Um, but he says world population will grow to at least 9 billion over the next 50 years. Um, so how does it get that? Why doesn't world population just keep growing and keep growing and keep growing? So he talks about that. So here's another TED Talk here with the same guy. Let's see if, so if it's an the same. Would be so, like this. In the past, um, it's a very different presentation, but it looks very similar. Here's five you, years later. So, doing math, you know um, that linear growth means so here's that another one. So he does quite a few of these TED Talks. This one's 2012. So you have to see if there's a more recent one, but they're excellent, excellent TED Talks. So I recommend uh, anything related to international business. This this is the kind of stuff you want you want to research. So depopulation is this first one. De -global globalization is his second one. And what he means there is the world is becoming much more nationalistic. Countries are looking within themselves. Um, and he talks about which countries will do well in that scenario and which will do poorly. The ones he'll, he says will do well are the US and even mentions Japan in that scenario, which seems strange to me. It's, it's a little surprising some of his conclusions, but it's very interesting stuff. And which countries will do badly? Countries that are extremely heavily reliant on exports, like Japan, uh, G Germany, um, he, he thinks are going to be the losers in this scenario. This is a lecture from back in 2016, so it's a few years old. But if you get his book, he goes into it in more detail, and you can you can see exactly what his arguments are. Deleveraging: the world has way too much debt. We have not seen deleveraging, so he missed that exactly. You know, this year has been a re-leveraging with governments borrowing so much money. Um, but eventually, we're going to have to take care of this debt, and that process is going to be very painful. Each one of these is has positives and negatives, but mainly negatives. And then the last one I think is the most negative is de democratization, which is um, if you look around the world, democracy. Uh, has been getting uh, really bad scores in, in surveys um, uh, in many, many countries where people just do not believe in democracy anymore. I don't know what they want to replace it with, but that's that's a major issue uh, globally as well. So listen to us, just one person's viewpoint and read others as well. I just thought it was very logical, very well uh, laid out. Uh, so you can get his book, or go and watch this uh, particular Masters in Business. Um, Barry Ritholtz will interview the same person more than once. So you might see if he's interviewed this man again since that time. Or just go out to YouTube and look for his name and find a video. He speaks at conferences quite a bit. And a lot of times these conferences are online, especially now after COVID-19. Uh, attended, I've attended a couple of conferences now where the entire conference was, um, was online. And they even had the videos afterwards. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. All right, so there's a lot of places you can go to learn more about the world of investing uh, from the standpoint of international stocks. So read, 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 read. Uh, one thing I will strongly encourage you, and it gets you back, gets back to this guy, um, Jim Rogers. <laughs> In finance, those of you that are finance majors, you make money in finance by specializing. You learn something in finance that no one else knows. Um, so if you have any language skill, if you grew up in another country, um, and you have a good knowledge base, maybe you spent your childhood in another country, especially if you speak the language, that's huge. Um, and that's an interesting country. You know, there's things going on that are, make it very interesting. Uh, you might specialize there. So that's what Jen Rogers did. Jen Rogers believes that, the, that this century will, be, will belong to, uh, to Asia. He, be, he believes the U.S. best days are behind it and that Asia is the place to be. And so he moved his family first to Beijing and went to China. Uh, there were some air quality issues there that he didn't want to expose his two daughters to. 
so he didn't move to Singapore. His daughters are fluent in English and Mandarin, and that was his thought is going forward, you better know Mandarin. That's going to be one of the fastest growing languages. Uh, very important in business. You know, English is still the dominant language in business, but he wanted his daughters to be fluent in both languages. And he wanted them to grow up in that culture because he thought that was where growth was going to be. The Economist a few years ago had a whole series of articles on where the second half of the century will belong to Africa. And their argument there is an argument you'll see a lot is with that depopulation that I talked about with, with uh, Richard Sharma, Sharma, depopulation is a huge issue for productivity because while young people are not as productive as older people, what's key for the growth of a nation is not how productive it is, but how much this product productivity is changing. And while young people are not as productive as 50-year-old people, the change in productivity of young people is much higher. And because of that, countries with, with young populations, while their productivity may not be great, the change in their productivity, the growth in their productivity is very high, and that's where you want to invest. And so uh, there was a really good series of economic articles saying Africa will be the growth story the second half of this century because that's where the young people are. Those are the youngest populations. They'll be coming up. They're going to produce work floors. Uh, they're going to ha other countries are going to have to let these young people in because like Japan and Europe where they're, they're not producing enough babies to offset the re people that are retiring and dying. Um, they're going to have to be uh, repopulated from, from people from nations in Africa. Just like in the U.S., South, South America still has a higher birth rate than the U.S. and Central America still has a higher birth rate. It is declining, but it's still higher than the U.S. and U.S. will be very dependent on immigrants from South South America and Europe will be very dependent on immigrants from Africa but that's the argument and so Jim Rogers he looked around the world he said Asia is the place to be he moved his family to Singapore made sure his daughters spoke Mandarin economist says no Africa is the place to be I don't know where in Africa I would go right now uh, there are a few interesting countries um, the new president of South Africa was interesting um, but he's really struggled, and that country has really struggled. Um, Nigeria has had s definitely some some major uh, issues with um, with groups that are you know attacking and terrorist issues and things like that. So every country has challenges. Even the U.S., you know, and England and you, um, Germany have have their issues. The question is not how bad is the country now, but is it changing? Is it improving? Do they have new leadership? new governments, anything that will make it better. And that's why I love this, this, this book, Why Nations Fail, and this great course, is they tell you what should you look for. If a country really is going to come out of the doldrums, come out of decades of disaster, what do you need to look at? What, is, what are those characteristics of countries that turn themselves around and become major stories? So you look at a country like Japan, my word coming out of World War II, it's amazing how fast Japan uh, became a worldwide, worldwide industrial powerhouse. Um, very quickly, much faster than other countries all around them. Why was it? And they go through that in this book. What was it, the characteristics? Versus in Argentina, he went the exact opposite direction. So interesting topic, much more here. So if I were your age, I might be tempted my, my problem is I'm not good at learning languages, but I might be tempted to move to a, uh, one, of, one of the up and running, coming uh, African countries um, like Rwanda, learn the language, learn the culture, live there for a few years, become an expert, and then offer a U.S. country uh, investment firm the opportunity to invest in Rwanda based on my knowledge of the country and you know just get used to it. You'd have to look at the stock market and see what was there. So you definitely have to do some research. But if you got the guts to do it, you could really set yourself up. It might be risky. The whole country gets taken over by some military coup and, and there's and there's no bit free free enterprise at all. Um, but you know it's it's to me it's it's tempting. It's not tempting now because I'm 57 years old. But if I were 22 years old yeah, that kind of specialization is what the stock, what, the, what Wall Street and what the investment world pays for. It's that kind of deep knowledge. And that brings us to our next topic. Where else can you have that deep knowledge 
there's another area where you can definitely specialize. And some of you probably are because you're in one of these asset classes here. But it's alternatives. So I'm back on page 20 of the class notes, alternatives. This is everything else. And very important that you always think of alternatives in two ways. They're usually pushed as diversifiers. They have low correlation to other asset classes. And so when everything else is doing badly, there's a good chance they're doing well. Gold is the perfect example of that. Gold is a metal. It's considered a commodity. It's part of alternatives. And then you have um, alternatives like real assets. And we'll talk about real assets first that are often a hedge against inflation. Um, and you, you think about um, um, you know, real estate, uh, commodities like oil and um, concrete and other things, copper, they, they tend to do well when inflation, inflationary powers are there. Especially gold does extremely well with inflation. So real assets can be a good protection against inflation. So those are the two things you want to set up for alternatives, why people buy alternatives. These tend to be fairly illiquid assets and so they better have strong characteristics to offset that. So let's talk about real assets first. So jumping to pages 20 and 21, let's start with real estate. So real estate, some of you may be real estate majors. That's, that's somewhat of a specialization. I just sent the name of a former student to USA Real Estate Company. You have a good friend uh, who's an officer there doing their development. And so I introduced them. Uh, he, uh, this student has a strong background in real estate, so I wanted him to at least see if he could get an interview. Uh, you can specialize. Usually if you do real estate, you'll do that in your entire career um, because it is such a specialized area, but you really can do well. I know many students go on the, re the residential side. I have one former student who's been doing the residential side. Uh, I think that's fine. You can make a living there, but the big bucks are more on the commercial side just because the transactions are much larger. Um, but, but both are fine. I just think it's the commercial side is really exciting because you're talking, there's just so many more options there because there's more categories. So what do we say about real estate? Well, the hardest thing with real estate is trying to figure out what its expected return and what its risk is. So the general thought is real estate from a return and risk standpoint is somewhere between stocks and bonds. Not as risky as stocks, but riskier than bonds. Not as high as an expected return as stocks, but a higher expected return than bonds. And so they tend to be low risk and low correlation. The problem with this is we do not have really good real estate numbers to actually know that. And the reason for that is, is real estate is not publicly traded. Real estate is not a security. Real estate is a, an asset. And because of that, you don't get daily prices like we do in the stock market and bond market. So we have to rely on what's called a, appraisal, and what we see is a term appraisal smoothing, which means when real estate companies value their properties, those valuations will not move as radically as the stock and bond market will. They tend to be very smooth, very, very kind of spread out over time. So in 2008, you see the stock and bond markets crashing. Real estate sold off, it had negative returns, but it wasn't nearly as extreme as it probably really was because of appraisal smoothing. Firms were simply not reducing the value of their properties as much as it would have reduced if it had been a, um, a public market. And that's because real estate's very illiquid. So you really don't know how much it's worth. You have to rely on appraisers and appraisals are very subjective. So let's start with commercial real estate, which is what I was talking about. And a good place to go for commercial real estate is Increfe. Um, this is one of the biggest organizations out there. Um, if you click on their their website, um, so if you, you just click on their website, it's Incref is a leading provider of investment performance indices and transparent data. So it's a data company. I don't remember what Incref stands for. The R E is real estate, um, but anyway. So a lot of data, they used to have free data where you could get the data and use it yourself. But um, the last time I checked their website, they don't do that anymore. You have to actually, you actually have to pay them a fee. So let's, let's see, I don't think property data products, 
Sproul's, Sproul's products. That doesn't sound very good because it sounds like it's kind of they're going to charge you you money. Uh, but anyway, but it's, it's a good place. They probably have some research that's free that you can get into. Um, here's their different funds: Nakri Fund Index, Open and Diversified Core Equity, Open and Equity, Daily Price. So that's Nakri. We'll talk about. Um, REITs here a little bit. That's an actual NACRI fund um, global. So if you click on learn more, will you really find anything? So they say they have quarterly returns. Let's see if it's there. Yeah, they don't have. So yeah, that's kind of disappointing. Um, so they used to show it back several years by quarter. But what you'll notice here is it's quarterly information. It's not even monthly. You can see how they say it's down 1.56%, but I can assure you real estate's down a lot more than 1.56%. I mean, think about what's happening in real estate right now with the work from home. And a lot of this work from home, there's a great article in The Economist where they talk about in the UK, work from home had a stigma to, a stigma to it. People didn't want to work from home because it, it's people who worked from home were considered to be not, you know, not the go-getters, the really rising stars in the company. But what's happened in UK with people forced to work from home, people discovered they really like it. And so we might find office space around the world that will be much less needed going forward as companies more convert to work from home and free up a lot of office space doing that. So I, I seriously doubt that 1.56%. My guess is it was probably even double digits down. But because of appraisal smoothing, um, they... They, they report a much lower number. Anyway, plenty of data there that you can work with. And when using the creep, they break things up ge ge by geography and by property type. Geography in the U.S., you've got the Northeast, the Northwest, the South, um, the Midwest, and, and the West. Um, and it, it does make a difference. Geography is very important on real estate, obviously. And then by property type, hotel, office, Retail, industrial, apartment, and malls. Um, hotels are probably doing okay. I know Airbnb has been a big issue, but the hotel industry tends to be doing okay. Office is under a lot of stress because of work from home now. Retail is under a lot of stress uh, because of COVID-19. Both of these have been really hit by COVID-19. People are getting more and more comfortable doing things online. Industrial is probably doing fine if you think about it. If we're going to be shopping online, then Amazon and Walmart are going to have to build a lot more industrial parks in order to low, you know, store all of those products that they're going to ship around the world. So rather than having stuff sitting in retail outlets, they're instead going to have stuff sitting in big industrial um, locations and, and hub cities where they can ship it around the country. Apartments are probably doing okay, but right now, you know, with mortgage rates so low, people are buying houses and housing markets doing well. Malls are obviously doing extremely badly. I don't know if you if you can even remember the last time you walked into a mall. It's it's been years for me, um, and even then, the only reason I went to a mall was to buy a gift card, not even to buy anything. So, obviously, there's some some commercial real estate that's doing really badly, and some that's probably doing okay. Industrial is probably doing okay right now. Um, so people, some people say, well, if you have that appraisal smoothing, and this is a tough thing on the exam, a lot of students just do not get into this nearly um, in detail enough. So really take some good notes here and do a little extra research. But people say, okay, if appraisal, if appraisal smoothing is a problem, what if we converted real estate into an actual stock? Let's put a bunch of real estate into a trust and let it, let's it let let that trust trade like a stock on the stock market. So we're going to take something that's very liquid, real estate, and we're going to make it very liquid by putting in a daily, a daily traded stock. Say, well, that's great. Now we have real estate, but we have real estate so we can look and, and see exactly what the risk and return is because we have daily numbers. Well, the problem with that is when you look at real estate investment trust stocks, they don't look like real estate. They look like small cap stocks. They have a much higher correlation with small cap stocks than they do with real estate. Uh, I think it's really funny. Uh, there's a firm, firm called Ibbotson. And they actually visited a lot of companies, including USA, and they were hired by NAREIT, by, by REIT, NAREIT.com, which is NAREIT, to do a study of REITs. And they, their study concluded that REITs were looking more like real estate than, by, than like small cap stocks. 
they came to USA, made that presentation. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. We need to look into that. So we did. We went out and ran some, ran some numbers. And Ibbotson was exactly right. REIT stocks had, in fact, looked more and more like real estate for about a year and a couple of months. But right after the time period of that study, REITs went right back to being small cap stocks. It was a about a one-year detour where REITs started behaving differently. But since then, they have not. In fact, REITs are very sensitive to interest rates. Um, many people buy REITs because they have very high dividend yields because the tax law requires real estate investment trusts to pay very high dividends. And so they tend to be some of the highest dividend paying stocks in the market. And so what some people do is they buy REITs as somewhat of a bond alternative. So instead of buying bonds, they buy REITs. So REITs somewhat act like a bond. When interest rates fall, they tend to do well. When interest rates rise, they tend to do poorly. But but they do have economic issues as well. So you got to be careful. Um, so anytime you make an illiquid asset and make it liquid, you end up with price discovery, and that tends to make your risk and your correlations go up. So REIT.com or NateReIT.com is a really good website. I won't go through it. In fact, I'm not sure this link actually works. I'm not sure why the fault's there. I should have tested this link. But um, look up NateReIT, which is N-A-R-E-I-T, NateReIT.com. You can try REIT.com, and they will have a lot of data on REITs. They're focusing on REITs, not just real estate, so it's a little bit different category. A firm like USAA, USA has, has equity real estate, which they own themselves, and USA has what they call private REITs, which are, they have REITs that trade, but not really on public markets, and then you have public REITs. I'm not sure USA has gotten in, in, into any public REITs, um, but they are very different, very different assets. They have very different characteristics. Um, now, I took over a mutual fund that considered real estate investment trusts to be real estate, they actually had 25% of the fund in real and REIT stocks, 25% in gold, 25% in stocks, and 25% in bonds. That that mutual fund just about blew up. Fortunately, it blew up before I inherited it, and they got away from that transaction. Especially 25% in gold would have been a horrible allocation. So fortunately, they got away from that. But for a while, they considered real estate 25% real estate. And they were putting 25% in REITs, not realizing they were just really loading up on small cap stocks. So it just made it a very volatile fund. <laughs> then you have residential real estate. We're not going to address that in this class because it's really not an asset class that you can get into as a, as a big institutional investor. As a small investor, you can certainly buy houses around the city and rent them out. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of this, this class. The second alternative, and we'll, this will probably be as far as we get today, is timber. Uh, I really love timber as an asset class. I find it really interesting. Um, so timber is interesting because it's both real estate and a commodity. So it has two aspects of two asset classes we're going to talk about. They're both real assets. So real estate is a real asset. Commodities is a real asset. So timber is both of those. So it's somewhat in between those two categories. You can grow trees for pulp, which is for paper, or you can grow trees for construction, which is a wonderful thing about timber, is you can you can change your strategy midstream. So if pulp is really high prices, it's doing well, then you can harvest your trees early. If not, you can let your trees grow longer and, and use them for construction, whether hardwood, hardwood or softwood. The returns have been excellent. This asset class does provide very good diversification. Um, there are timber REITs, which are real estate investment trusts that do timber, and they do tend to have some interesting diversification benefits. Um, but timber tends to be a good diversifier because timber tends to be a local market. It's so expensive to ship timber around the world. So for the U.S. to produce trees and ship them to China would just be so expensive because trees weigh so much. Um, and so it tends to be a local market, um, tends to focus on what's going on in construction and, and the economy and around where the trees are being sold. You know, Texas is a big tree producer. You may not be aware of that, but if you go to East Texas, there are some very large tree farms there. Some of the hurricanes that have come through in the last several years have done major destruction to those tree farms. Um, but East Texas is a huge uh, timber timber area of the United States. <clears throat> California, obviously, 
uh, in many places in the Northeast. There's a lot of major places. Um, and one thing that is very unique about timber, I've tried to think of other asset classes. There really aren't too many I can think of. Um, but timber is a place where if you don't like the current price, you can just store it on the stump, which means what that is is you just let the tree sit there and get bigger. So while you're storing it, you actually get more product. You can't say that with oil. If you have 20 barrels of oil and you really don't like the oil price, you can store oil there, but you will not end up with more oil uh, two years from now. You'll have the same amount of oil you had before. Um, so cattle, maybe a little bit with cattle, but eventually, you know, eventually a cow gets as big as it's going to get, and there's really not much more you can do. You can't just keep feeding it uh, and getting it fatter and fatter and fatter. It comes to a point where it's about as big as it's going to get. So, you, so timber is very unique. There is a great web, website, HTRG, and as you would expect with this website, you, you pull it up and everything's green with a bunch of beautiful trees and a mountain. Uh, they don't show any pictures of them ripping trees out of the ground, which the technology on that has gotten really good. Um, it's, if, you love, if you're a tree lover, you won't love seeing those videos, but you can go and see these videos. They have these machines now that can just rip the entire tree out. Uh, no longer do you need um, lumberjacks with saws. They just rip the tree right out of the ground. Uh, here they are replanting it. Um, obviously, timber companies are very sensitive to the economy and the global warming. And so um, they make a big deal about how they plant a lot of trees. Um, so, you know, at any given time, they've got a lot, a lot of trees that are being grown. But this is Hancock Timber. We talked to these guys. So I talked to some of you, if you're really struggling with your career, what do I want to do with my life? Here's something I'll throw out to you to think about. Um, you have an undergraduate degree in finance. Go get a job at a firm like Hancock Timber. Get into the timber industry and then go get your master's not in finance go get your master's in forestry and you'll be set for life i really don't see that timber is going to be a declining industry i think timber will be around for a long time uh, building houses and um, furniture and all kinds of, you know we use wood quite a bit um, so i think it's a great industry uh, allows you to go globally as well. Where I work in Costa Rica, there are some huge t uh, timber farms there. They're actually growing pine trees in Costa Rica. Well, it's, it looks like East Texas in Costa Rica, but pine trees grow well there. Um, so there are global markets, and these firms are very sophisticated, very specialized, and that's what I'm talking about with specialization. Undergraduate degree, degree in finance, a graduate degree in forestry, and you'll have a job where you spend half your time in blue jeans and t-shirts walking out onto tree farms if you like the outdoors. So you'll spend half your time on tree farms and the other half in a suit going talking to clients. I think it'd be a wonderful career. And if you really specialized in it, uh, you'll be set for life. You wouldn't have any trouble getting a job anywhere. So, so I'll stop it there with that for you to think about as you're, you know, you think about your career. Um, you don't need to plan out the next 50 years, but this is something certainly you can, uh, you can apply with a timber company. You see if you get a job, if you could, then set up your career, what you're going to do next. I think it'd be pretty, pretty incredible. So we'll stop there. We'll finish up the alternatives in our next class.